morning and welcome to everyone in the audience and uh, everyone joining us online. Um, this is uh, a, an event that I'm really looking forward to. Um, I had the great privilege uh, that some of you may have joined a dinner last night that uh, allowed us to get some insight into one of the great Canadian business leaders, one of the great Canadian global business leaders, uh, and how Dominic Barton thinks about issues uh, both in Canada and around the world as he thinks about his business at Rio Tinto, uh, his life as a uh, public policy expert, his life as an academic, and all the remarkable things that uh, Dominic has done in his life to date. Um, so I, I hope you all really enjoy this session. And thank you for joining us. Um, I want to group our discussion today into three main areas. Personal and career, geopolitical issues around Canada, China, the US, and Europe, and business-specific questions around supply chain challenges, ESG, diversity and inclusion as it relates to the mining industry, and generally Rio Tinto, and some recent developments, Dominic, in your company. You've had a remarkable career spanning both public and private sectors. You've advised CEOs and boards around the world, as well as prime ministers, presidents, and heads of government over a long and successful career. I wonder if you might briefly share with us your background and what success factors have most shaped you for who you are today. Well, thank you, Doug. It's, a, it's an honor to be here and uh, to be with the forum again. I think the last time, I, as I said last night, uh, I'd spoken out or talked publicly was then, and then I was uh, uh, not really permitted to. So it's nice to be able to be out uh, to uh, talk about life and the world. Um, that's a, it's a broad question, so I don't know. You know, I, I think, again, when I, when I think about career development, I, I think about two things. I think about mentors and experiences, which I think grow you. And, um, and I, I really enjoyed my time at McKinsey. There was amazing mentors there who taught me things. By the way, not, not just within McKinsey, they were most often clients, CEOs that you'd be able to spend time with and understand how they worked, how they made decisions, what their challenges were. It was, a, it was a, an amazing classroom, if, if I could say, on that front. But, but also it was the experiences, and, I, and I, one of the reflections I would have is the most often when I took risk, when there was a real chance it would not work, is when I grew the most. Um, and, I, and that was all the way through my career. Probably the, the ones that I, that I think about the most are actually when I went to Asia. I was in, Korea, in South Korea, and I moved there in 1996, just before the financial crisis. And, um, and based because of, of work I'd actually done in Canada with banks and the banking system, which I think is, a, is world class and remarkable in how it works, without knowing that that would be helpful when the crisis hit in South Korea and actually Asia, and it was a system transformation to be involved in that um, right at the beginning and all the way through was just a, it was a transformative experience because it's about a systems change. Um, and then in Singapore, because at that, in, in 1998, 1999, most people were running from the hills from Asia. There was this crisis. The view, the view was the tiger economies have kind of, you know, imploded. This isn't going to work anymore. And, and, and many, many companies um, and, and journalists and so forth are writing about, well, Asia's had its comeuppance. Um, and then I watched Singapore in 1998, 99, that decided they wanted to become a global financial center, which was so ambitious, it's not even funny. Um, but to see them build that uh, and, and make that actually happen, watch the leadership in the government, but also in the private sector make that happen, that was a transformative experience. So those are, those are probably some of the things. It's, it's experiences and then people that have, you, you learn from uh, and, and, the, and how you grow, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Um, speaking of McKinsey, you had a long and highly successful run uh, McKinsey was ranked the leading consulting firm in the world for each of the nine years under your leadership, which is such a remarkable accomplishment in any big business, certainly in a big global business. <clears throat> as successful as the company has been, however, 
it's not been without controversies, including around the company's work for several authoritarian regimes around the world, as well as work advising Purdue Pharmaceuticals on opioid sales strategies. I suppose my question is going to be about building and maintaining the right culture and incentives to service high-performance clients and highly competitive team members, all while building and maintaining a respected and high-powered global franchise. Would you spend a little bit of time talking about managing a large global advisory business in the context of multiple clients in multiple jurisdictions in industries old and new with young uh, and diverse workers uh, composed of highly ambitious, highly educated people, all of whom are hardwired to be successful and maybe see their personal success in spite of the reputational consequences of the work they're doing. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a bit of a complicated it's question. A, no, but I, I think I get the, the essence. I think it, look, I, I spent uh, 33 years of my career at, at McKinsey and I, I loved it. Again, as I, I learned a lot and it was more the impact. It's a, it's a firm that's focused, it's client first. It's not it's not money first, it's, it's actually client first. There's a strong set of values, obligation to, to dissent, um, and a range of things in terms of how it's, work, how it's to work. And I think it, um, and again, it's a very confidential firm and that we don't talk about any of the work we do. Um, so we, don't, we certainly don't go out talking about successes and I think there are obviously quite a number, otherwise the firm wouldn't exist. But there also have been mistakes that the firm's made and, and I think we have to learn from that and always have. It's not, I don't think any place is perfect. And there are things that, you know, that you mentioned the opioids, there's work in South Africa that, that uh, we've done. Um, there's, a, there's a book, the New York Times has a book. I don't want to peddle uh, that book because I don't like it very much, but it's what, you know, uh, that uh, talks about the firm and sort of what happens. I think it's the title is what happens when the most powerful consulting firm comes to town. I think it's a bit of a, screed against capitalism and we, we happen to be very much capitalists and so forth. But that said, I, I think values are what really matters in it. And, and I, I think again, how we ensure that people are focused on, on impact. What is it that we're actually trying to drive? Be, being very careful about the clients that we're working with. And we will work on topics that are risky, um, that, are, that are challenging. Um, you know, so and, and I, I, and I think we should, or I think the firm should. That's the nature of what what we do. And there's, you know, if I think even about, we're going to talk later about the energy transition. There's a lot of things that the firm actually developed. The carbon cost curve came from McKinsey. That was a developed by a guy named Jeremy Oppenheim, who's now left and set up actually his own firm, uh, Systemic. Um, but there's a lot of innovation that happens that way. And again, I think the thing is to reflect on where we have made mistakes, what's occurred, why did that occur? I found that it tended to be more senior people, not the younger people where the problems occurred, which I think is something interesting to look at. There weren't, it wasn't the younger McKinsey people, it's sort of more senior people. So that's w what happens, how to, and we have to understand that. Um, but I'm, I feel very confident in terms of where the firm is. I think another f statistic that I sort of look at that I think is important is, is you think about output. I think there are roughly uh, 450 former McKinsey people that are, that are running billion dollar plus companies. And that, you know, I think that says something to the values of the place. It says something to the competencies of, of the place. And that's an important part of it. But I think a big challenge is not being comfortable talking about the firm and ourselves, and that's something that has to be done in this the new the social media world and so forth. Hmm. I don't know if that gets it. Like, yeah, it, it does very much, and and it strikes me just as a business person, what a remarkable alumni resource you have, uh, McKinsey has hmm. for for future business. Yeah. So, well, I'd say again, it's it's actually not so much the alumni, but what people don't realize is most of the work in McKinsey comes from reference. We're, actually, I think McKinsey's not very good at being a salesperson, if you will. We, we're out, outrageously expensive. People look like they're 13 years old. <laughs> what is it? So the, the work actually comes from reference, which is impact. And, you know, I, it, it continues to, to grow. Um, and I think it's, it's, that's the nature of the, of, the, of the work, the impact of the work, Either, because we're not required. No one needs to have 
McKinsey or a consulting firm, and, and so you only do it if it actually is going to work. I think, and so that that's a market, if you will, um, that 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 has to be dealt with every day. Thank you. <clears throat> Can we pivot to China? You have a long history of living and working in Korea, in China. Dominic has taught at the university in Beijing. He's chaired the Business Advisory Council in Seoul. He's advised the Economics, uh, Singapore Economic Summit Development Council for 10 years. He's authored and co-authored several books, helping business and political leaders better understand the challenges of doing business in Asia, amongst many other accomplishments. <clears throat> All of that experience made you the perfect choice for Prime Minister Trudeau to select as Canada's ambassador on September 4th, 2019. I recall that you and I happened to be sitting beside each other yeah. at a head table, uh, and you leaned over and said, there's going to be an announcement coming. Uh, stay tuned. And, and that was the big announcement that afternoon. Um, your appointment came as Canada fought to secure the release of the two Michaels after over a thousand days held hostage. There's lots we could cover on the broad topic of China-Canada relations, but I wonder if you might share with the audience some insights into how you as ambassador and the government, without telling any tales out of school, handled discussions and negotiations to secure their release. Yeah, that, um, you have to, I don't know, I'll have to try and boil it down, if you will, because it, it was, um, it, 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 it took, you know, two and a half years to to do to do it, but I, I think the the core element is we had a complete breakdown in communications. Right, there, there was no communication going on. There was an incredible amount of anger, as we all know, in Canada, but there was also an incredible amount of anger in China. And it, it wasn't just at the at the political level; it was people. It, it was a, so people were very upset. No communication, and. Um, what we basically had was four parties that were going to be involved in trying to get to a solution, all of them with very, very strong and severe red lines. We have Canada. There's, we're not going to negotiate. You know, we're not, we're not going to interfere with the legal processes whatsoever. The prime minister made that absolutely blind, like almost he he almost stamped it into my forehead. There's just no. We were going to. We are not. There's no no deal. You, you, we do this properly. This is how it's going to work. We had China which had very strong point of view of you tied the knot, so you need to untie it, just get it, you can do it, get it under, you do it, if you need to sort it out, don't you sort it. And then we had the United States, uh, which was, was also involved. They also had red lines about what, what they were doing. And then we had Huawei, right, which is, which is there as well. So you had four parties, all with red lines, and the Venn diagram intersect was pretty small. Mm -hmm. So it was tr a lot of it was trying to figure out <clears throat> what is the solution path to be able to to get that uh, to work, and um, and that that took a lot of um, you know cr creativity within the the, the team of, of people that were working on it, and then it took building trust because when we had a we actually I believe we had our solution uh, in November of 2019 of what we wanted to do. The challenge was how to get everyone to believe that that could work, including in Canada, right? So it was a and, and again, the, the, I cannot, not just saying this uh, to be in, in the public, but the Prime Minister was unbelievably helpful, had her back, my back the whole time. I just felt I could, you could experiment, try things, do things. And, you had, and that was needed because of what we had to, had to do. And then it was really a matter of, of trust building to be able to get to a solution that could actually work. And the challenges were COVID came, so the, it was very difficult to shuttle uh, back and forth. I was doing that in the beginning that I, that I couldn't, so we, that, that ch made it challenging, um, but we were able to figure out a way uh, to do that. We had the Trump administration, then we had the transition to the Biden administration right in the middle of this, so there were lots of those challenges. It was, it was very up and down, stressful. There were periods where I thought we were very close and then they, it didn't happen, and all the while what made this not a academic effort or a, a, an exercise or a, a geopolitical issue is there were people involved and the two Michaels. And, you know, the, uh, every, the, in, our, in our embassy in Beijing, we had a, fo a photo of them right in the entry. So every day, every morning when you walk in and when you leave, you're reminded. I, I remember on Fridays in particular, you know, um, just go, I'm, I'm going home for the weekend. These guys are 
there. So you, you, you just, you, you, it's very personal. And then, and then you see them, you know, I had half an hour uh, with each of them once a month until the COVID, then there was some break, breakdown and even that conversation, but you have half an hour to be able to listen and communicate <laughs> and it's their only vehicle to get to the outside world. And, um, and so the preparation for that half hour to make sure it is, they feel good, they get what they want, we're able to transmit messages, we're able to get back was, you know, something that was critical on, on that. And then it was, so that, that was the personal side, which you never, which I, which I think was, was very emotional. As I mentioned last night, it was, I found it, um, and I still think I'm, de I'm dealing with that. Uh, and they're, those two of them are, are very close friends and they're in there because you, you get to, you, you get to see people and, and very, and people that I'm just blown away with, with how resilient and, you know, strong they were through, uh, through all of these periods, not knowing if you're going to come out, um, always what, not having much information, uh, living in quite challenging situation, really remarkable people. So it, that, that was the personal element of a, of a geopolitical thing. And then there's other things that have to be done uh, also with the relationship. I mean, I, I felt that our relationships were very narrow in China. We needed to have a much broader set of relationships. It's, it's, that's what's critical. Um, and you, you can't have relationships when you need them. You need to have those relationships before you need them. Um, and, and so making sure that we have a deep fabric uh, in that country, because that country has, there's many challenges, and I can tell you I've seen the, the dark sides of it, but there's also many parts of, of China that are, that are quite positive in what they work, and there's many different people. It's not a black or white mass of, of people there, and so really understanding what's happening in provinces or in academic institutions or in cultural institutions um, or on the science side or on the business side. There's so many elements. So while they're trying to really broaden and deepen those channels so that we then whenever we will have problems and we will, I'm sure we're going to have more, right? It, that we've then got the the channels to be able to deal deal with things. And um, I think that's, that's an essential part of... Um, of what we were trying to do. Thank you. Um, there's a ton of questions. We could spend another hour talking about that. One of the questions, maybe I'll, I'll leave this if there's a Q&A session afterwards, is has it irreparably damaged Canada-China relations? But before you go there, I, I want to spend a few minutes of, of our remaining time talking about the mining industry in mm. Rio Tinto. Uh, first off, let's get a tough question off the table, you came into your current role after what could be described as a number of serious governance issues at Rio Tinto. I'm thinking about the Jukin Gorge in Western Australia, about difficult and complicated mineral deposits in, in Guyana, Mongolia, and Serbia. Uh, you also came at a time of significant changes in the executive suite. How do you think about your role in setting the right tone across the organization? rebuilding relationships with stakeholders, and evolving the organization's culture, given all the recent challenges over the last several years? Well, first thing I'd say is that, that that's part of the reason I was attracted to coming to Rio. I think Rio Tinto, um, it, it, it has been a great company, and it, it has had major challenges. The blowing up of the Jukan Gorge, a 46,000-year-old you know, sacred site, uh, for for uh, the PKKP and other, it, it just the we had a culture survey, you know that 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 revealed significant amounts of sexual harassment, racism, bullying that was going on. And uh, again, I wasn't there, but credit to the management, the board for publishing it. They just they put it out there. Um, uh, and as you said, there were therefore many changes in the in the executive suite. But fundamentally, I think of the. You know, I think about the industry. I think it's one of it is. I think essential for us to be able to do this energy transition. And the energy transition of this is the scale of an industrial revolution. It's the scale of the internet revolution. It's massive, and we are not going to be able to do the energy transition without minerals, critical minerals. It's just not going to happen. Um, and mining is essential for being able to do it. I, you know, I've talked about this last night. We, since humans have existed, we have 
uh, produced about 700 million tons of copper. We are going to need to do the equivalent, 700 million tons of copper, which is what we've done since time immemorial in the next 20 years, if we're going to meet the Paris Climate Accord. That's a remarkable stat. It's, yeah, it's just, and, and this is from the IEA. It's not from the mining industry. This is from the International Energy Association. So, and I could go on. I don't want to bore you with that about what the amount of copper and steel and aluminum and rare earths that you need in a wind, basic wind turbine. Um, I, the, an, an EV vehicle having about six times the number of, uh, plus six times the number of minerals that you would have in a conventional car. I could go on about that, lithium and so forth. So this is an essential industry to be able to make that transition. Um, and that's very much the focus of Rio Tinto. It's the, it's the second largest uh, mining company in the world. It's, um, and it's completely focused on that mission and doing it in a carbon neutral way. They want to be, the Rio wants to be carbon neutral uh, by, t by 2050. And that was, again, something that attracted me to it. But it's also an organization that had, had stumbled. Um, but I think that when you stumble, it's a chance for a reset. And, and that's what I'm most keen on as a chair. I'm a non-executive chair. There's an amazing CEO and an amazing management team, including here in Canada, led by uh, Ivan, who was there last, there last night running the aluminum uh, operations globally, but living in Montreal. Our chief scientist for Rio Tinto is in Montreal. A lot of amazing innovation on the rare earth is, in, is actually in Canada. Um, uh, so, so I think, again, this is a chance for kind of resetting the path. This is a great company. Let's rekindle that. Uh, and culture is fundamental. How are we going to ensure that we are behaving in a way that we work with local, the local communities, have the social license, that we enable the people in the organization to, to prosper, to unleash themselves, to feel safe uh, in, in what they're doing, um, and that we, we build a company that is going to make a difference. We, I think there's been zero communication of what we actually do uh, versus where it is. People think, I think we're a bunch of people with pickaxes going off into the mountains, d digging up things. It's just so not there, but that's our fault. But we need to explain that better. So the, there's, a, there's a set of cultural, operational, social license, ESG priorities within Rio Tinto, but there's also some industry-related things. and. And so I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunity. And we're fundamentally in a supply shortage situation, a significant one. And so that's, it, I think it's a, it's a very exciting time for the industry. So that's a really good segue into what I think used to be referred to until the last year of Rio Tinto's work here in Canada as the, maybe the un, unused gems <laughs> here in Canada. And I'm thinking about the company's Critical Minerals and Technology Center in Mon Montreal in the announcement last week with the government to form a strategic partnership, uh, including the story that uh, Jakob uh, put last week in the uh, op-ed in the Globe and Mail. Can you just spend a few minutes talking about that? Yeah, I, I'm very excited by this. It's, uh, again, you know, it's a $740 million investment. Uh, we're, we're putting in uh, over 500, the government's putting in over 200, but just to basically work on our, our Rio, Tinto, Rio Tinto fair and titanium business, right? Which actually uh, produces titanium dioxide, um, which is a very important material uh, for building many, um, you know, sophisticated products in the, you know, in the airframe industry, phones, uh, cell phones, technology, and so forth. But one of the, the things about this, there's two elements to it. One is creating these, these uh, rare earths, right? So scandium, I'll just give is one example. Scandium, we only make in the world about 20 tons. It's a, it's a very small amount from a global point of view. But that scandium, a small amount of it put into aluminum, makes aluminum unbelievably strong. So the Russians are using that in their MiG fighters. That their jets have scandium with the aluminum in them. The the two biggest suppliers of scandium in the world of that 20 tons are Russia and China. Uh, Rio Tinto was producing zero in January of this year. We're now producing two tons, or three tons, which which is about uh, you know it, it's a, we're the third player. But the goal with this effort is to go to 12 tons and then broaden it. So we'll become. Uh, you know, a very significant global player in the scandium area. And there's many other rare earths, I won't bore you with the, that, that are there that are critical that we can do through the process of the waste that comes from the, 
from, from the uh, titanium dioxide process. So, and, and the other, so that's one part of it, but the other piece too is, is the decarbonization with this blue smelting, again, which is a technology that's been developed in Canada. Right, we also have Elysis, which is a, 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 a new way to be able to make aluminum in a very much reduced you know, carbon emission way, radically different. It's a joint venture between Alcoa and, uh, and, and Rio Tinto with Apple, who's actually played a big role in, in bringing us together to, to be able to do it, which will transform how we make aluminum. So we'll have the greenest aluminum in the world. It can be recycled. Um, and that's where the exciting thing to me is more how we can build an industrial value chain from the green aluminum with these rare earths. I think there's huge opportunities for Canada and North America on that side. So this is just the beginning of a process of what we can do. And it, to me, it fits in again with this notion of the energy transition is an industrial revolution. And, and I think that's what excites me in terms of the new types of jobs, the battery uh, value chain, the automotive business, and, and, and airframes, all sorts of, you know, anything to do with high tech, solar panels, all of that will be created um, with, with these products. So it's a big step, but only a first step in a broader process, I think, on a, a new industrialization, which will be exciting. And what, what, I'm, what I was particularly tickled with, if I could just say it, by spending time in the Saguenay um, you know, in, in, in Chicoutimi, in Sorel, where this is just the, the brain power and in ideas that are coming, because that's coming from there. It's the scientists and the team that's there that's actually building this. There's also a lithium uh, experiment that's going on, it's, it's just incredible, done again by people just deciding we're going to experiment, figure out how we can do this in a very ESG uh, positive way, and have come up with a, a fundamentally new way to be able to, to do that. So. It's of strong interest, and the U.S. government is also highly interested in this. They they want uh, they they're very keen as well from a critical supply and chain point of view. We do more. We have very big operations in Utah. In in uh, we have a, we have a we have a very large copper find in Resolution in, in Arizona, and then we have a big uh, borates business in California. So there's the, the U.S. side is is important, and we want to do more. But to your point, I think we've neglected that. In the, there hasn't been as much. The focus has a lot been in Australia, the Pilbara, um, in Mongolia, which they're, they're all extremely important. But North America has really come alive on that. And so I think it's going to be an exciting time. Well, that is a really uh, upbeat way to probably end this. I know we've run out the clock. There's a lot more I wanted to ask you about uh, Christia Freeland and her friend shoring yep. speech last week. In, Washington, there is lots to talk about, uh, but I know we're getting the hook. So the question is, do we have time for Q&A or no? No, I'm told okay. not. <laughs> so sorry about that. You'll have to buttonhole uh, Dom as he's leaving the stage if you have any tough questions. Anyway, thank you, Dominic, thank you. For, uh, for agreeing to do this. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and, and thank you all for for joining us and for joining us online.